Hey guys, and welcome uh, to my Pasadena home and office and APU. We just move it around via Zoom. That's all we do. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Um, this is a first Monday event. It's March 1st. And so we do these first Monday events through our animation program and cinematic arts uh, department program all the time where we bring in professionals. And um, I have the honor of introducing our guest who is I'm gonna call him a good friend of mine because then I'm gonna owe him a coffee or something or tequila later. Um, but a uh, good friend of mine, Jorge Gutierrez. Did you see Book of Life? Of course you did. Came out before Coco, all right, all right. Who came second? Let's just say it's obvious, okay. But Jorge uh, is the creator and director of Book of Life. But before that, he did created El Tigre, what a great TV show that was on for many years. Many of you guys grew up with it. Uh, with his lovely wife, Sandra. We're going to talk about her too, I'm sure. Um, he's developed uh, and produced a lot of different things, but currently, uh, and he's good friends with everybody in the industry, I know that, uh, but he's currently at Netflix working on Maya and the Three, which is something uh, we're super excited. We're going to hear everything about it. A lot of exclusive things that Jorge is only going to bring to APU today. I'm really excited about that. Um, but uh, let's hear it for Jorge Gutierrez. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Greg, thank you for having me. And of course, Tony, anytime you ask, I'm, 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 I'm more than happy to uh, come visit. So, so looking sweet. forward to this. All right, so let's dive in. Whatever you guys, uh, how do you want to do this, Tony? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing we didn't talk about, right? Um, you know, we'll, we'll just, you know, do like a podcast like we've done before sure. or a conversation. I like to keep it pretty informal, to tell you the truth. One thing I'm going to tell you up front is that um, I don't know if you can see this. This just came out. This is a, a oh, yeah. film. I'm starting with something about me instead of Jorge. That's how rude I am. Uh, but this art of book came out, and I don't know if you realize this, but of there's course. a Jorge Gutierrez a little uh, quote on the back. So thank you for the quote. And there's a book in the mail. That's part of the thank you from APU. Uh, but I'm going to make sure you get a signed copy of that, okay? Yeah, I would be, I mean... You know, I love the movie and I, I love that you guys made an art of book. I'm sure there's a bazillion gorgeous drawings and I'm a big fan uh, of Carter Goodrich. So Carter Goodrich is the man. We know that. Uh, but yeah, enough about that. I just wanted to show you that that got made. Um, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is and, and I, I've had some conversations with you before this, and I think you have such a great uh, career story of how you entered into um, into animation. And these days, as we have a lot of students online right now, um, there's always a concern of how do I break in and how do I get into animation? And, um, and you were a young Latino boy that probably had even deeper concerns about that. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. And I particularly want to hear your um, Jules Engel story, All right. <laughs> your portfolio review story, if you don't mind. Happy, happy to tell it. Uh... So yeah, I'm originally from Mexico City. Uh, I moved to the border to Tijuana, uh, which is across from San Diego, when I was nine years old. Uh, and for a kid like me, working in animation just seemed impossible. It was uh, it was like being Batman or being the Pope. Like those were not things that were going to happen. Uh, by the way, Batman and the Pope—they both have cars named after them, right? The Pope mobile and the Batmobile. Folks. That's the connection. Hey, what? I didn't get That's that. That's why I wanted to be both of those. Anyways, <laughs> back to uh, Jorge Mobile. Yeah, the Jorge Mobile. So as, as I got a little bit older and I started uh, falling in love with writing stories and drawing and movies, because to me, those three things honestly weren't connected. They were different things, right? So I admired painters and I admired writers and then I admired movies and animated movies. But in my head, those three things weren't together. Uh, yeah. When I was about 13, 14, a family, we had a big dinner, family friend uh, was there. And my dad asked me in front of everybody, this is very Mexican, Jorge, what will you do with your life? Right, because that's how, that's how Mexican dads talk. Uh, and in front of everybody, I said, Father, I want to be a painter, a writer, and a movie director. And he laughed ah, like for 10 minutes, right? Everybody laughed. And then this family friend said, hold on, that is animation. 
you get to make paintings move and tell stories. Okay. Thank and God for that guy, right? I never saw that guy again. As far as I know, <laughs> my, my father had him killed after that dinner. <laughs> I never saw him ever again. So after that point, I, I, I became obsessed with it. And I, you know, I've always loved anime movies. So I started really diving in, you know, this is before the internet. Uh, so I started researching libraries. And then that's when my dad said, if you can get into the hardest school in the world for animation, I might let you study it. Wow. Um, so I, had a, I had a dad, I have a dad who was very smart about knowing I had a rebellious fire in me. Yeah. So always knew how do I, I will motivate him by telling him he can't do it. Right. Wow. And to this day, he's a master of doing that with me. Uh, so then uh, I found out about CalArts, right? This is, this is a late eighties, early nineties. And everything I could grab were the, the brochures and the little books and all these things. And honestly, there weren't that many animation schools back then. There wasn't a lot of animation programs and, and it was a very niche specific thing. So I, in high school, I was told, oh, that school's super hard to get into. Uh, you're gonna get rejected multiple times. I called the school and they told me, apply, this is what the school told me, apply as a high school junior so that you get rejected so by the time you apply as a high school senior and you get rejected again uh it'll be easier because you'll, you'll be one step closer and eventually you'll get in at you know four or five or six tries uh wow. and, then, and you can go to a community college this is what they told me right you that's like getting a job at disney these days yeah to learn turn on those things and i remember one of the really interesting things they told me too was you're not going to come here to learn how to draw we expect you to already know how to draw. You're coming here so we can teach you what to do with knowing how to draw, mm. right? So I was like, all right, so uh, what do I need to do? And they were like, well, figure drawing and uh, you know, animation drawings, which I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. So I, I'm in Tijuana. Uh, for any of you guys who don't know, Tijuana is a, a spicy cesspool of crime and villainy. And it's a very complicated city. So when you want to figure draw in Tijuana, it's usually exotic dancers. Yeah. So all my figure drawings looked like exotic dancers. So my dad would look at my drawings and go, what the, what is this? I'm like, that's what they look like. So it, it was a little, a little crazy. And then I thought, well, CalArts is an American school. So I'm going to draw the things that the Americans want to see. So I'm going to draw Mickey Mouse and Bart Simpson and Buck bunny and basically anything i could think of as an animation drawing mm. so i show up to cal arts as a high school junior and i have my portfolio full of animation drawings and a portfolio full of my paintings and i was literally taking my paintings so that i could apply to the painting schools and the art schools just to see if i could get in because even back then i knew i, I can never make a living as a painter but wouldn't it be cool if i got into one of the fancy schools for that yeah, right? purely ego based. So I take these two portfolios, I get in line. There's a character animation line and experimental animation line. And as much as I love character animation line, uh, character animation back then, I thought, well, I like stop motion and I like computer animation things that I'm starting to see. I, I kind of like experimental animation. I, there was a TV show back then called Liquid Television. And I had seen Henry Selleck do some stuff in there. I had seen Peter Chung, uh, you know, Eon Flux shorts were on there. And there was just a lot of quirky, weird stuff that I kind of gravitated towards. Mm. And then I would look at the, the character animation department and it really seemed like Disney, classic, traditional Disney stuff. And I just didn't, at that time, I didn't really think that's for me. So I go into experimental animation, I go to this long line, I, I, there's a super buff dude in front of me, like a, like a surfer guy. And he had, I still remember, he had this like steel portfolio uh, with these like beautiful figure drawings. They look like, like Glen Keane drawings, right? So yeah. he puts these down and he takes, you know, he's very cocky and he's like, he puts them down. Jules Engel, he's like a doctor looking at x-rays, right? He's like looking at these drawings. He's like, mm. and at the end he's like, that's it. Uh, like Jules was Hungarian, right? The, that's it. And the surfer guy's like, oh, that's it. Uh, and Jules uh, goes, no, you have no voice. Closes his portfolio. 
and the server guy was like, "What?" <laughs> like it was like he wiped out. He was like, what? "Dude, like, yeah." What just happened? So he like grabbed it and he walked away. And he, he was literally like, "I'm watching this happen." And I, I'm 17, and this guy looked. He looked like he was 30 to me. Uh, so I walk up with my little portfolio, hello, and my name is Jorge, and I like put my portfolio down. And Jules, uh, you know, he had a cup of coffee and he opens my portfolio. And he, he, it was like, he was immediately disgusted by my drawings, right? Like <laughs> the way he grabbed them was like someone cleaning up a public urinal. Like he was, <laughs> and, he, and he goes, what, what is this? And I'm like, oh, that's a, uh, you know, that's Bart Simpson. And he's like, no, this is shit. <laughs> and he goes drawing by drawing and uses different words, excrement, you know, all, all the <laughs> variations, uh, all the scatological variations. And I remember the last one, he's like, why? Why do you poop in my eyeballs with this? <laughs> so I'm devastated. He closes my portfolio. That's a tough critique right there. Oh, tough, very tough. Jules was hardcore. So yeah. he closes my portfolio and then he zeroes in into my soul and he said words that are unfortunately still tattooed there. Uh, and he goes, you are not an artist. Oh, you have no voice. You say nothing. A copy machine could have done this. Mm. I, was, I was speechless. I was literally like, what? And, and like a lot of you guys, I was used to being the best, you know, the best artist in my high school. So to be told that was shocking. And then he goes, figure out what else to do. This is not for you. So I, I grab my portfolio, I walk away super sad. And, you know, the, again, the universe took pity on me at that moment. I left my painting portfolio on the table. So as I'm walking away, there's a little piece of one of my paintings peeking out of the portfolio. Jules opens it, his eyes explode. And these paintings were paintings about things that I loved. Mexico, uh, Day of the Dead, Lucha Libre. The, every painting had a story. So his eyes light up and he's like, hey, sad boy, come back. <laughs> so then I walk back. He, he goes, what this, what this? I, I tell him, oh, it's a painting about a lady who had an affair with a coyote and now her kids are half coyote and it represents uh, Mexicans in the US trying to fit into the cult. I basically tell him a story about every painting. He's like, oh, what this? And as I keep telling him the story, I get really excited because I can tell he's excited. So by the end of it, it was 10 paintings. By the end of it, he, he has them all out like an art dealer. And he goes, all these, each one is a story. Each one is a movie. This is your voice. And he goes, why did you do these? And I said, well, because, because I, they came out of me. And he goes, why did you do the, the shitty stuff? And I'm like, well, because I thought that's what you guys wanted to see. And he goes, you're a stupid boy. Never do what you think they want to see. Do this. You're an artist. You're going to basically said, you're getting into the school but never do that, do this. And if you can make this move and you can tell stories with this, I will have seen something I've never saw before. And yeah. that was it. And here I am, right? 20, it. Is it 22 years later. No, what is this? This is 1993. I don't even know the math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Math years away. It's an art it school, came, not math school. It all came true. So I got into CalArts at 17. My dad just about had a heart attack. Uh, as an international student, as you guys know, you don't get financial aid in the first year. So my parents had saved for years, my grandpa had saved for years, and I didn't have enough money to even go for one year. Uh, this is 94. So my plan was, I, I can only afford to go 0.7 of a year. I'll figure something, this is how naive I was. I was like, I'll figure something out while I'm in there. Yeah. And then since I can't afford to do with my whole degree, I'm gonna take the classes of every, a uh, year and do them in one year. So instead of getting uh, four years, I'm gonna try to cram the, the, the whole degree into one year. Uh, you, you know, you're supposed to do a student short every year. I'm gonna do four, right? I had the power of youth in me. I was like, <laughs> nothing can stop me. So I, as the first day at CalArts, I start signing up for classes and eventually I get to two years worth of classes and I get sent to the, the, basically the dean's office. I go to the dean, Stephen Levine, 
I tell him my story and he's laughing. He thinks this is hilarious. And he goes, look, I'll make a deal with you. If you can do two years worth of classes in one year and get a high pass in every class, I'll give you a reward. So we shook on it, right? Did you hear what the reward was? Oh, the reward was he gave me a full scholarship. Oh, oh, okay. Now, now you're talking. Yeah. So basically, I, I, I agree. I go back and I started studying my classmates and I started studying, you know, recon the whole situation. And again, I went from being the worst, well, the best artist in high school to then feeling like the worst artist in the world to then getting into the school and being a little confused, honestly, by how I got in. And then when I looked at my fellow classmates and I looked at what people were drawing and upper class and people, I realized, holy cow, I'm the worst artist. Mm. And I don't mean that on, a, on an artistic level, I meant that on a skill level, right? Mm. So, and, I, and early enough, I figured that out. Just because you have skill doesn't mean you're not, you have something to say. And just because you have something to say doesn't mean you have skill. So those two things are, uh, are different, right? So when I, when I saw what my fellow classmates were doing and I saw what people that were doing really good were doing, I kind of realized this is, you know, again, I was super young, but I realized artists are super lazy. They're incredible at procrastinating. <laughs> they're incredible at uh, saying they're going to do something and not doing it, being way too ambitious and never finishing. Uh, I need the right pencil, the right software, the right paper. Oh, I need to be inspired. Oh, I saw this thing and, and now I'm depressed and now I can't draw. Like, it was amazing to me that that was such a giant thing keeping people from doing things. So I said, that's it. That's my in. That's how I'm going to make it here. I'm just going to outwork everybody. I can't control how much talent I'm born with. No one can. But I sure as hell can control what I do with my time. Yeah. So I'm just going to do more. So if I get a character design assignment, I'm going to do 10 on my own. I'm not going to show up with 10 assignments because people are going to hate me, but I'm going to curate it and I'm going to pick the best one. And that's the one I'm going to show up. So I'm going to cheat by doing more behind the scenes. Right? Great. Great idea, though. What a, what a, what a concept in itself. How many people think of like, okay, I'm going to overdo it and I'll propel myself forward faster if I could just do multiple versions of something pick the best one, like you said, curate the best one, put that one forward, you're always going to be in a better light than if you just had the one, right? <clears throat> well, and then I started doing the thing where, all right, for my story class, I'm going to do the boards for the movie I'm going to do, and then in character design class, I'm going to design the characters for that short, and then in color class, I'm going to do the colors for the short. Like, I started basically going, each class will specialize me in, in something, yeah. but I will always, always apply it to a short. Uh, I read this Robert Rodriguez book that said every film student has 10 crappy shorts in them. And the faster you get those 10 out, the faster you get to the good stuff. So I took that literally. I was like, all right, I got to get 10 out. So instead of pretending every one of my shorts is a masterpiece that's going to change the world, I'm going to use each short to get better. So in one, I will focus on editing, and one, I will focus on voice acting, and one, I will focus on color, one, I will focus on animation. And I basically picked my battles. And the, 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 the sacredness of a short meant nothing to me. It was just a, a step to go yeah. to something bigger. Yeah. Uh, and that was another thing I saw. People were just incredibly ambitious with their shorts, and they never finished. Mm -hmm. Never. And starting a short, easy. Anybody can do that. Finishing a short, that's something else. Finishing a good short. Amen. Yeah. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> so that was, uh, that, was, that was something that happened to me early on. Uh, so the school gave me a full scholarship. I, out of high school, I did my CalArts degree in three years. Um, then the Mexican government saw what I was doing, and they gave me a full scholarship to do a master's degree. Wow. So I had to do three years. Uh, bachelor's three years master's so I was at school for six years so what that was what that did to me was I got to see what happened to people in school when they graduated and I got to see what happened to, to people I thought were really good students when they didn't do well outside of school 
And I got to see what happened to students that I thought weren't that great, but then flourish when they got into the industry. And the big lesson I learned was honestly, networking and playing well with others and being a good personality and, and getting along with everybody goes much further than talent. Yep, yep, than skills and talent. Yep, it's true, that's a huge thing. And if you, if you can figure that out in school, that's the other thing, your network of support, your friends and your colleagues that you're starting out with, you go into the industry, guess what? If you help them, they help you. And as you all grow, you all help each other. And so that was huge to me. What I started seeing and the people who were jerks and assholes who were super talented, they got to the industry and man, they did not flourish at all. The yep. people that were easy to work with, the people that were positive and encouraging, willing to learn, had a good attitude, they did great. So that was another huge lesson. It was, oh, the good guys do win. And of course the industry wasn't perfect and shenanigans were happening, but that's every part of the world and that's every industry. But at least that to me seemed very pure. The other big lesson I got in school that I, looking back, I get asked a lot, what would you change when you were a student? And as you guys can tell, I am Mexican. So by the time I got to school, uh, drinking age in Mexico is 18, right? So that means you start drinking when you're 15 or 16. <laughs> yeah, right. So by the time I got to college, I was done partying. I was there to focus. <laughs> and then by the time I got to college, uh, I was already with uh, the love of my life, Sandra. So I really got to not party and not worry about that other stuff and just focus, literally focus on becoming better and becoming and making every penny count. And I remember back then, I, I had a lot of friends who they would dangle the carrot of success in front of themselves and go, well, if I work really hard, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a lot of money. And I, if I work really hard, uh, you know, I'm gonna get a fancy car and I'm gonna blah, blah, blah. Like it was always some carrot of success in front of them. Mm -hmm. As an international student who came from a third world country, I, I didn't have that luxury. To me, it was, if I don't get a job, I'm gonna get deported because yeah. I need to get a work visa. If I don't succeed on this side, I let down my family, I let down uh, my girlfriend, I let down my culture. Like I, so I use that to motivate me more than I want to win something. It was, I don't want to let them down. And that's a dangerous thing to do. Yeah. And I admit it was tricky, but it worked for me and it still works for me. Mm. But to me is it's never been about the getting there. It's about the journey of why we're, you know, the process, enjoy the process much more than the result. And you're going to be fine. That's amazing to me because I think most people would just crush and fold under that kind of pressure. Like when you were saying, I didn't know this about your, your story, but that the Mexican government supported you by giving you money to finish your master's at CalArts or do your master's. To me, that's, that's amazing. Uh, it's an amazing amount of pressure. It's great, great opportunity, obviously. And you saw it as that. You're the kind of guy that I know um, a door opens up and you blaze through it you know, and you see what happens, you know, and I love that kind of, I have that same kind of stupid blind faith that, you know, it's going to work out somehow, <laughs> you know, um, but speak to me a little bit about the pressures and how you deal with those kind of pressures, because you have been uh, for many years now, but even going back to CalArts days, you've been out there as you know, I'm, I'm different and I, I, I want to put forward the Mexican culture. I want to tell stories that are from my childhood, from my upbringing. And you've kind of been that, that picture of success of doing that. But what has that done for you? You know, uh, has that played, had a toll on you or been a pressure that has been hard to deal with? Absolutely. That's, 20, that's, a, that's a, a deep, a deep question. I know. Uh, I, got, I went there. Me was... When I, when I came into CalArts and when I saw what students were doing, one of the things I realized immediately was there's people like me from all over the world and they're coming here and they go, the industry wants us to do things like this. So my work will now become that so I can get a job. And I saw people losing, them, losing where they were coming from to assimilate the workforce. And 
if you loved the craft of animation, it didn't matter to you as much. But if you were coming from story or design and you were being asked to take some of those things out, it really bothered me. And I remember being super excited, uh, you know, when Emperor's New Groove was gonna come out and uh, Kingdom of the Sun was gonna come out, uh, you know, well, the same movie, but then they, they flipped and uh, <laughs> El Dorado. Uh, I was super excited because I was like, wow, the, the eyes of Disney are gonna look at where I'm from. And, and since I don't see people like me show up on TV and show up on cinema and animation, I unconsciously feel that my, my culture and my people are not that important. And therefore I'm not that important, right? And my whole life I, I've had to uh, basically have empathy and relate to white characters. And I've had no issues with that. Just like I've had no issues relating to characters from Japan and characters from all other parts of the world. But man, when do I get to relate to someone like me, mm. right? So that became a big thing for me. And I remember having teachers early on and they were absolutely right, because I really struggled where they went, look, Jorge, you keep doing this Mexican stuff and you're not getting a job. Not because people are racist, but because no one's doing this. Yeah. So if everybody is looking for, you know, tap dancers and you're a hip hop guy, it's not gonna happen, man. It's not, it's not because people hate hip hop. It's just, it's just the way that, you know, the industry works. Right, everybody wants boys to men. You're not boys to men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, no, then, I, I, and then I had other teachers who would go, you have to make a giant choice. One, are you gonna keep pursuing this stuff, this basically inner journey into your culture and get really good at it? Or do you diversify? and get versatile right. and try to get really good at a lot of other things so that you are more employable. So that would have been the logical thing to do. And I yeah. saw a lot of my friends do that, but I wasn't that guy. I said, if I'm gonna bet, I'm gonna bet on myself. And no one's doing what I'm doing and no one's doing this type of stuff. So I might die on this hill, but I'll be the only one on the hill. I'm all in. Nice. All the other days would come around. I would get called in, you know, but various studios would look at my work and I had art directors look at my stuff and go, this is great. Where's your, you know, the other stuff. The other stuff. I'm like, what do you mean the other stuff? They're like, you know, <laughs> the not Mexican stuff. I was like, no, no, this is, you know, I'm a Mexican restaurant. I'm gonna cook you Mexican food. And they're like, well, we don't make Mexican food. So I was like, well, I guess I won't be cooking at your restaurant. And they were always shocked. They were like, don't you want to learn how to cook other foods? <laughs> I'm like, you can get other foods anywhere. I'll cook you the best Mexican food. All the food metaphors work really well, but we were basically talking about, you know, content. So oh, yeah. as I graduate, uh, I make this, you know, I spent three years on my student short. I literally worked so hard on this thing after making maybe two or three shorts a year. I focused for three years on one short, right? Wow. It's called Carmelo. You guys can look it up online. Uh, I, I hated CG animation and how cold it looked. I basically forced myself into embracing CG, learn all this ridiculously hard software, I make this short. It's about a little boy who dies. Like it starts on Day of the Dead and, and you're at the funeral of a little bullfighting kid. And the story is, why did he die, right? What happened and what is Day of the Dead? Book of Life literally came from that short. So I finished this short, it wins the student Emmy and I got to go to the Cannes Film Festival. Like it opened a bazillion doors. Mm -hmm. So for all of you working on your student shorts, every hour you put into your short will come back to you a hundredfold. It is completely worth, it is your, your card to the world. When you tell people, hey, I'm good and I'm funny, here's my short and that's good and it's funny, that short just spoke for you. Because if you just tell people these things, it doesn't mean anything, right? And no one wants to hire you to see if you have it. And no one wants to hire you to see if you can do it. They wanna hire you because you did it, mm. right? So that's very different. So I put the short out, it's super sad, like literally super sad. 
I started a Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon. You know, I get, I, at that point, the short wins an Emmy. I, I get a, a manager signs me, who I'm still with. Um, every studio I would go to, he said, write a, a movie. Turn your, your short into a movie. Uh, Shane Acker did that with mine. So certain shorts are getting turned into features. I've never written a feature. So I go and I buy a, how to write a screenplay in 21 days. I wrote this giant outline for Book of Life. Uh, I go pitch it everywhere in town. This is the year 2000, uh, mm -hmm. no, 2001. Every studio, right? Disney, Fox, Warners, DreamWorks, everybody tells me the same thing. Uh, this is amateurish, this is weird. No, you know, the quote, no one wants to see a movie about dead Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> and then they told me, and they, and they were right, you're just some dumb kid out of school. Why yeah. would we let you direct the movie? Go make a TV show, go do something, get experience under you, and then maybe you'll be ready to direct a movie. But right out of school, you are not ready. And they were right. Mm -hmm. So I get all these start, because my short is CG, and this is 2001, I start getting offers to work on CG movies. Uh, and I had been an intern a year earlier on the movie Stuart Little. Uh, and I, I learned I did not want to be a, an effects character animation uh, artist at that point. So I go, what do I do? What do I do? If I go into the world of CG, story and design, which are my two passions, they will just fade away and I'll just get swallowed up by the CG world. I'll never get to tell my stories. And I don't know anybody from that world who's gotten to tell their stories yet. Hmm. But if I go into my own TV show or my own, my own thing somewhere in television, maybe I can tell my own stories. Uh, and I started seeing all these crappy internet cartoons pop up everywhere and they were terrible. And I said, well, I can do that. I can make a less terrible version of those things. So I, after spending three years learning CG animation and my, and my clock ticking, you know, finding a job, I said, well, I'm gonna bet on myself again. So I, I learned Flash, pirate software, a version of it. I teach myself Flash. I make this three minute, you can look it up online, three minute short called El Macho versus the Mariachis of Doom about a Mexican wrestler. I put it on a website called Icebox, which was like America's Got Talent. Like people, anybody could just post stuff. Mm. It got uh, 20,000 views in one night. Wow. And in 2001, that's like 2 million views today. Yeah. So my ex bosses at Sony, where I did my internship, call me in and they go, hey, we have an internet division and we, uh, we are going to make little cartoons and we saw what you did and we want to buy your short and we want to hire you to make 20 more shorts. And good news, you get to write them, you get to direct them, you get to animate them, you get to color them, you get to <laughs> voice them, you get to do the sound, you get to do the Yeah, music. I'm doing all the work, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, this is like, this is like CalArts but they pay you. So, <laughs> so I went over there, they gave me a work visa and mm -hmm. it spoiled me because it was my first job out of school and I was getting paid to make my own stuff. So, so getting that high of someone paying you to make your stuff, I got hooked. I was mm -hmm. like, this is the greatest job in the world. Uh, all the CG job offers were to do layout, to do previs, uh, and I remember ILM, the Lucasfilm people said, um, you get to work on episode one. Uh, you know, come work on the ranch. You'll, you'll work with George Lucas. And this, you know, this is before episode one comes out, before anybody knew it wasn't going to be that great. So, <laughs> yeah. so that was a huge decision to make. And so when I call the lady at Lucasfilm, and I, I'll never forget it. I, tell her, I told her, uh, her name was Joanne. Hey, Joanne, uh, I thought about it. I haven't slept. I'm really, really made a big choice. I'm going to have to turn down the job because I'm going to go make internet cartoons at Sony. <laughs> <laughs> she thought you were crazy in that. She goes, Jorge, Jorge, Jorge. <laughs> and I quote, you will regret this the rest of your life. Oh, boy. This is the worst decision you could ever make. She's like, this is Star Wars. Come on, yeah. you want your credit. So, uh, cut to Valencia, uh, opening night, episode one, midnight screening. I'm there with all my friends and everybody's giving me a hard time. You could have worked on that. You could have been on that thing. And I'm like, eh, it's okay. And then as soon as freaking Jar Jar comes out, <laughs> 
the theater is silent and I'm cheering. Yeah! <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> no regrets now. <laughs> so that that was my start. Uh, and then as, as a you know as an international student, we we you get one year when you graduate. One year the government says you have practical training to find a job. And if a studio doesn't sponsor you, you get sent back. So for me, it was holy cow! I've been here six years. All the faith, literally all the faith, the school put in me, my country put in me, my family put in me, everybody who's been helping me, I am but the tip of that spear. And mm -hmm. if I miss and if I fail, it's on me, it's not on them, it's on me. So it's, it's an added pressure. So early on, I just learned, use that negative, use that fear, use all the bad stuff for good. Use it to motivate you because it's not going to go away and you can't pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah. Use it. Use those flames. That's, I love that. Oh man. And you've also had so many in your, uh, because you are Jorge and you did bet on yourself, you've had very early success. You've always, uh, oh, I have that same mug. Is that from Real Effects? This is from uh, uh, Netflix. Greatest streamer in the world. <laughs> Plug. We haven't even yet yeah, plug. <laughs> They're paying my paycheck right now. We'll get to them. Um, but you've had a lot of opportunities because you're an outgoing guy too, and you have a great charisma, and you you know you're very ex expressive, and obviously a great storyteller. You've met a bunch of people, and you've had a lot of people, um, you know, in your corner. And I remember early on hearing about the Noble Boys, and what that is is a group of students, and I don't know your involvement in how you became a noble boy, but um, we've talked about here at APU. Um, I love Maurice Noble. He was one of the great um, uh, uh, layout artists and really creators of the look of the early uh, Chuck Jones um, uh, uh, shorts and everything. And he was like the right-hand man of Chuck Jones working with um, all the Looney Tunes shorts. And so uh, Maurice Noble, you became friends with him and kind of, uh, he became a mentor to you, right? Yeah. He, and then later Guillermo del Toro, but yeah. you've had a lot of people speak into your life too. And, and you've been very receptive to those things. Tell us a little bit about Maurice and how that started. I mean, after after what happened with Jules Engel, the CalArts guy, yeah. uh, he was someone that I said, I just want to learn from him, not in class, but I want to learn from him at breakfast and at lunch. So I literally timed like, when does he have breakfast? And I would go and I would like go, hey, Jules, can I buy you a coffee while you have breakfast? I just want to hear about your experiences as an artist. And especially artists that are older, they, they want to share these stories, just no one asks. Mm -hmm. So Jules got to tell me a lot of stuff. And Jules, uh, for any animation nerd, Jules was you know, part of UPA, worked at Disney and Fantasia, was, you know, was from a European uh, mentality of arts. So he hated Maurice Noble. Maurice oh, Noble really? hated Jules. Oh, and then that. between Maurice, Jules, and then Ivan Earl, there was this like triangle of hate. <laughs> so Jules kept saying, you know, his big diss to Maurice was, he is a true artist, but he's lowered himself to just do backgrounds for Chuck. And he lets Chuck walk all over him. Uh, and then his big diss to Ivan Earl was, he doesn't care about story. He cares about his paintings. And we're not making paintings, we're making animated movies. So, you know, like all good arguments, he had a point too. Maurice's hatred to Jules was, He's artsy fartsy, hoity toity. We are making animated cartoons. We're not making animated films. Yeah. You know, the, we are, the backgrounds are there to highlight the performance of the characters. We are set builders with color and light. Mm. Super, super valid, right? Like all good arguments, they all had, they all, they were all right. Those are my favorite arguments when, in, especially in the story, right? When everybody's right, those are the best arguments. So 
hearing all this like secondhand stuff about Maurice, I imagined this monster, right? Like this horrible human being. So one day at story class, I had uh, Don Hall, who just directed uh, Raya uh, as a story teacher, and he brought in Maurice Noble as a guest speaker. So I'm in his class and I'm like, I'm like, I'm from Team Chuzango. <laughs> what do you know, old man? So Maurice Noble shows up, like immediately I'm like, you are right, you're a genius. Everything you say is true. And I <laughs> just get swept up in, in the Maurice love of, of his, not only his work, but he literally, you know, his last name is Noble and he was the most noble person I've ever met. He uh, told incredible stories, talked about all his theories, just brilliant, brilliant artist. After class, Don Hall goes, hey, uh, Jorge, can you stay to talk to Maurice? Maurice is putting together an anthology uh, series called The Noble Tales. And what we're doing is we are going to have different artists in animation tell a folk story from all over the world. Oh. And Maurice really likes your stuff. So he's wondering if you'd be willing to do a Mexican one. I'm like, oh, I would be honored. Uh, so he'll come back next week and maybe we can go have dinner and he can tell you what he's looking for. So a week goes by, Maurice comes back, we go to dinner and I pitched him seven shorts. Nice. <laughs> Right? I was like, you only get one shot with Maurice Noble. So I show up and I'm like, this short's about this and this short's about this. And I had done drawings and art for everything. And he's, he's just laughing. He's going, what? This was dinner for me to try to convince you to do something. And you showed up with seven? And, <laughs> and did you adapt these? I'm like, no, no, these are all original folk tales. And they're all inspired of different folk art. So Maurice immediately was like, who the hell is this kid? Uh, I, I start started showing me stuff. So as soon as he started getting jobs in the digital world, he called me up and he said, Jorge, I want you to be my co-art director because I, I hate computers and I don't want to use them. Chuck just called me to work on a, you know, internet cartoon called Ting World Wolf. So I got to do art with Maurice, print it out, take it to his house. He would destroy me and I would do more. So I, I, it was like getting paid to learn from Maurice. Yes, from a master. And the stories, the stories were fascinating. And the, the relationship he had with Chuck Jones was fascinating. And so I've always been enamored of, well, what are the legends like? And what are their, what are their paths and their stories? And I mean, he told me how he went from designing Macy's uh, windows to working on Snow White. It's, it was cra a crazy leap back then. You know? This and, is what and, I love about talking to you, Jorge, is that you've always had an appreciation of the masters, the people that came before you. You've learned and grown from them. You've, you've mentored underneath them. And yet now where you sit, I mean, let's face it, you're a master at what you do. You've created practically a genre of, of filmmaking for yourself. And now you have ton, and I, so let's move forward now to Netflix animation. You're working at Netflix animation. You have an overall deal for how many years? I don't, I don't even know. I, I hope it never ends, but uh, <laughs> you have a great overall deal to not only develop the, the, the film, uh, the project that you're currently on, but also other shorts and, and um, other uh, uh, series and other features. You have an overall first look deal kind of thing. You've, you've kind of come to a place now where you're getting ultimate support, it feels like, and you're, you're able to hire now those young Jorge's, those very excited young students, those, those uh, you know, fresh out of college and, and they're, they're scared and they revere you and look up to you. What is that like for you now? And how do you speak to those folks? Well, I mean, I, I was you guys. I was, I was a student 20 years ago. And by the way, all your heroes, all my heroes, all Tony's heroes, they were sitting where you're sitting. We yeah. were all coming out of school, all nervous about the future, all nervous about what's gonna happen. Everybody you admire, every single one of them, study their journey. Like no one comes out of their mom and they're handed, uh, you're a director now, <laughs> you're a showrunner now. It's right. always a journey. And yes, there are the exceptions, the freaking anomalies that somehow people get their own, project or movie, but that's like one in a thousand, 
no, I would say one in a million, but most of us, you have to work your way up. And even me, like after I had my own thing, it fell apart and I had to work on shows that had nothing to do with Mexico and nothing to do with my culture just to eat. But while I worked on those things, I worked on my own stuff on the side, always. That was a big lesson too. If you don't work on your own stuff on the side, you will never work on your own stuff, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, that's when that happens. Uh, but now when I meet young talent and when I meet people that remind me of my struggles, I try to show empathy and I try to help out. Uh, I really believe in animation karma. Uh, if you help those that can help you, that's Hollywood. That doesn't mean anything. But if you can help those that can't help you, that mm -hmm. really is helping. And as an as a animation artist and as a lover of the history of our medium and as a lover of the talent in our medium, I want to leave it better than I found it. Right? And, I, and the voices, the people who got to tell stories and, and the people who had those careers before us, we owe it to them. We stand on their shoulders. So the best thing we can do is try to learn from them and then pass that down, right? You guys are gonna be sitting where I'm sitting 20 years from now, talking to a class, you, or you better be, uh, and trying to help out others. But that's that journey. Uh, and you can't help everybody, but you can try to, try to help as much as you can. Uh, and, and the other big lesson, and Tony, you know this, is you help others and others help you. Yeah. So when things aren't going good, all the good stuff you did usually comes back to you. Mm, I love all that. And we're, uh, we're getting to a point where we're gonna start opening for uh, questions from the students. So um, Brian, I'm gonna ask you to go to gallery view and if a student has a question, just uh, do a little hand raise, you know, if you know how to do that on your screen uh, so that I know that you have a question. I'm gonna take a preference over uh, from APU students, of course, for those that are out there, just so you know, uh, APU animation program students, first preference. Uh, but yeah, I need to be able to see them. So Brian, if you could go to the grid um, view, that would help so I could see everybody. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you just about what's what's it like being at Netflix? How are uh, tell us a little bit? Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on? Um, kind of your plans there as they're developing. So after Book of Life, I was told you can do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to make a Kung Fu Space Western because I figured these movies take so long to make. And I love Kung Fu movies. I love Westerns and I love sci fi. And I figured that's 15 years of my life. But so why don't I cram them into one story? So I started developing uh, a Kung Fu Space Western over there. And then Trump won the presidency. And my, uh, my movie dealt with the border, the Mexican US. Oh, wow. Uh, and so I was told very wisely, there's no way anybody will make that movie right now. Wow. So just wait till after Trump. And then if Trump wins again, then you'll really have to wait. Uh, so that was a, that literally a pol politics in the real world affected my work. Uh, I got to go to Google and make a virtual reality short called Son of Jaguar that you guys, uh, if you're into virtual reality, I, I think it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, then after that, I had a talk with, uh, with Guillermo del Toro, who, who again is my mentor. And he said, you know, Jorge, what would be really good for you is to play in someone else's sandbox. Mm. Uh, I did that with uh, Hellboy uh, and I did that with, with Blade Two. Alfonso Cuaron uh, did that with Harry Potter. It'd be really healthy for you to, to go play with someone else's universe. Uh, and as, as, as soon as he said it, Chris and Phil, the Lego movie guys, uh, called me up and they said, hey, we love Book of Life. We know you love Lego movie because I'm very vocal on Twitter about how great I thought it was. Uh, why don't you make a Lego movie for us? So I met with them and they, they, they pitched me, you know, sort of the stuff that they were working on. And there was a, a racing movie that they were doing called Billion Brick Race that had lost all momentum and had lost the director and, and, the, and the writer. Uh, and I got really excited um, because I said, why don't we make a racing movie about race? And we talk about Ooh. how some people are born with more Lego pieces than others. But what really matters is what you do with the pieces you got. And it'll be obviously a metaphor for what's happening in the world and 
all this crazy stuff. At some point, a year into it, they loved it. Uh, the Ninjago movie flops. Oh. And uh, I could tell all momentum was being lost. The faith on the Lego sequel was starting to falter. And then they started telling me, uh, not Chris and Phil, but you know, the executives, your movie's too hot, too, this, too racy. <laughs> so how about, it's not about that. How about it's just a racing movie? Mm. At that point, it was one of those moments where I realized they're not wrong. I'm wrong for being here and trying to make mm. that. They don't make those type of movies. They make Tom and Jerry and they make, you know, they make their, their thing that makes them money. I'm literally the wrong person. So I quit and I quit all the time. I'm kind of known as someone who, the moment, <laughs> the moment I see the math and I go, bing, I don't, I, it doesn't work out. I, I just get out. Uh, one of the biggest things that I was taught by Guillermo del Toro was, if you make something you hate and it's, a, and it's successful, you're screwed the rest of your life. Oh, it's the worst thing that could happen, right? Yeah, because people will only want that from you. If you make something that you love and it's incredibly successful, that will also crush you because everything will be measured up against that. What you need, you know, it calls me Gordo. What you need, Gordo, is make something you love that does okay. <laughs> and then you're in the clear. Yeah. Yeah. And that was Book of Life. <laughs> I love Book of Life and it did okay. And the pressure was off. So after, after I quit at, at Lego, Netflix calls me up. And again, Twitter, the power of social media, I literally put on Twitter, man, I'd love to do a limited series. I get called in. It's the day of my birthday. They, they, they brought in a bunch of fancy, you know, directors and, and showrunners from animation, from all, all studios. We're all there. It's like Harry Potter. We all, an owl showed up with, a, with an invitation and we all showed up to this, to this uh, party. And they sat me down and they said, what do you want to make? What's a thing you can't make anywhere else? Wow. And Wow, out of my mouth came my and the three. I said, I want to do this Mexican Lord of the Rings and I want it to be a, a four and a half hour movie and it's going to be, you know, the cast of armies and monsters and magic and blah, 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 blah. And literally expecting them at the end to say, ha, 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 hilarious. No. That's cute. What else? Yeah. Uh, they literally went, all right, let's make it. And that was that. that. I've never had that happen in my whole life. Obviously, it's thanks to El Tigre and Book of Life. Uh, but if you, if you, you know, if you guys decipher what I, my career, it's been success, failure, success, failure, success, failure, 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 success, failure, 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 success. Like the pattern yeah. is this. Thanks to my internet cartoon getting canceled, I got to do a Disney pilot. Thanks to that pilot not happening, I got to do another Disney pilot. Thanks to that pilot not happening, El Tigre happened. That got picked up for series. It won seven Emmys in one year. It gets canceled. Thanks to that happening, I made Book of Life. So if El Tigre hadn't been canceled, no Book of Life. Thanks to Book of Life not being a gigantic success, I'm not stuck making sequels for the rest of my life uh, on Book of Life. So every failure and success has allowed me to keep going. So I get to Netflix, I get to make, you know, my and the three. At that point, they go, well, what else do you want to make? And I just pitched a ton of stuff. I want to do a preschool show. I want to do an interactive show. I want to do an adult animation show. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I don't mean erotic adult. I mean adult yeah. as a family guy. Uh, I want to do uh, shorts and I want to do, I want to do everything because I love the medium. And there's no studio on earth that will let me do that. Like if I go to Disney feature animation, you make feature animation or you make limited series, but you're not gonna do a preschool show and you're not gonna do an adult animation show. Like no studio will allow you to, any creator to do all those things in one place. So That's I said, amazing. I wanna do that. Yeah. I wanna, I wanna do the thing that only you guys can do. So that's been the love affair. And, it's, and we're in a tumultuous, uh, passion-filled relationship right now. Uh, <laughs> and, and Maya comes out, you know, end of this year. 
And yeah. Another thing that hasn't been announced will come out that I made last year will come out this year. And then there's a lot of stuff that I'm working on that probably won't come out for years, but that hopefully gets announced. But I've never been happier. I've never been more inspired. The pandemic really, really helped. You know, I'm someone who thrives on, on adversity. So <laughs> the <laughs> pandemic was the perfect wave for someone like me. And yeah. it made me value my life and it made me value the life of my loved ones. And it made me value what we do even more. It made me value how important what we make is to, to kids. And it made me value uh, the fact that we get to work during this craziness. So all those things just became, you know, more wind than the sails of my ship. So I, I'm thriving and I'm loving it. My only regret uh, from all this is I just hope we don't go back to the old way completely. I'm excited about this new future where, you know, maybe we, we work from home some days and some days we go back to the studio, but let's not just pretend this never happened. Let's sort of adjust and, and, and cause I think mental health is a big, is a big part of what we do. And I think uh, time with your family and time with, with your loved ones is very important. And I think it's ridiculous. That's one of the things I've always found ridiculous in animation is we make stuff about keeping Family. families together yeah. while behind the scenes we're destroying families yeah. with overtime and, and difficult uh, projects. So oh, yeah. good news, if you guys will have me, uh, my production just gave me 30 more minutes. Oh, are you serious? Okay, yeah. I was just gonna say, oh my gosh, that's great. Uh, guys, we'll stay on a little bit longer if that's cool with you guys. Uh, because I was just about to say, we ran out of time for student questions. No, 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 student questions. Great, minutes. great. All right. Uh, raise your hand again if you have a student question. APU students, let's go with Victoria first and then Cam. I saw those hands first. Uh, hi. Uh, I just want to first off by say you're one of my absolute role models. I love you and I, I love everything you've done. Um, you really shaped me trying to identify with my culture. So I just thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Oh, Victoria. Um, uh, I have two questions that yeah. I've been agonizing the past three months since Tony told us you were gonna talk to us. So I'm nervous, um, it's okay, take a breath, Victoria, you're okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, well, I wanna start off with the funny question cause I thought this was to start it off was um, if there was a world food contest, right? And you were the ambassador from Mexico, what would be the dish you would put in to win that contest? Oh, good question. And so here's what I figured out about food. It's when you eat the food and who you eat it with and what part of your life you ate that food in, that matters, mm -hmm. right? So my favorite tacos, other people have them. They're like, well, they just take, taste delicious, but why are these the best tacos in Mexico? And I realized, oh, these are the tacos I had when I fell in love with Sandra. And mm. so uh, anytime I eat them, I remember those moments and I remember that time. So I think that's one thing I figured out about food. So if I, if I had to represent, I would present those tacos and we would lose, but I, I will have relived that moment forever. <laughs> yes, that's a great, great answer. That's great. Um, and then for my serious question, I've, I've seen tons of your interviews and I've I've always had questions in regards to what you said but I love story writing I'm a big screenwriter that's my my thing um I remember in an interview you said that uh when you come up with stories that are passionate you you like stab your heart for stories to find those um big moments um and I remember you had the story where you pitched out to a you were trying to pitch these Mexican stories of your childhood and they said that they were too specific um, that you that you found that you were having this like central idea or uh, that was missing from it and that's why they weren't connecting to it. Um, I have the same problem with that. Uh, how did you figure out a way to to get around that and to create those more uh, stories that resonated with those producers or those people? That's a, a great question. Uh, and this happened to me early on and I would present things. And if there was, a, you know, an executive from Latin America, they would get all the stuff, but people who weren't from Latin America were super confused. And I realized that's bad. That's really bad because mm. what I, the stories I tell can't depend on you being from my background because then it's, it, the audience is going to be very limited. 
So, you know, I was like a scientist. I was like, well, what the hell? So I started re like refocusing my energy and going, okay, why do I love Amelie? And I didn't love any other French movie I saw that year. Why did I love, you know, the Brazilian movie, City of God? Why did I, why do I love Seven Samurai? I've never been to Japan. Like, why, why do I love Spirit Away? Like, what are, what are these films that not only are incredibly authentic to where they're from, but are inc- like phenomenally universal to the world? And what I realized was the culture is the canvas, but the story, like what you're painting has to be universal, right? So Book of Life, a kid who uh, dies to, to really live, that's Orpheus. That's a Greek myth. And by the way, that idea of someone going to the underworld for something they love, that exists in Aztec culture, Mayan culture, Greek culture, uh, Hindu culture, like it's all over the world. So these stories, these themes have to be universal. And what you're telling has to be not dependent on knowledge of those things. So, uh, you know, Amelie, uh, innocent, optimistic, lonely girl who brings other people together and therefore finds the love of her life. That could happen in Mexico, that could happen in Japan, that could happen anywhere in the world. It could happen today, it could happen 200 years ago, it could happen in a sci-fi movie. Those themes are universal, right? So when you're thinking about your story, yes, be very specific about where the culture is, is set, be very specific about all those little details but the, the, the heart, what I call the heart, is should be based on something universally truthful. Uh, you know, mothers and daughters, that's the whole world. Fathers and sons, uh, man versus a village, uh, nature versus man, like all these things are universal. So don't, don't feel that your story has to be about the culture. Have your story be about you and the cultures where it's set. And that's a big one. That's a big like, woo! <laughs> that's good advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Victoria. Okay, Cam, you had one? Yes. So first off, before I start off, thank you so much, Jorge, for coming here. You are a blessing. Like, honestly, like, so amazing. And, you know, before I choke up, um, the question I have is, so... You were a man who, you know, you taught yourself all these programs, all this stuff, because if nobody else wanted to make your stories, you were going to make it yourself. So when it came down to, when it came down to showing it to people and, um, and becoming that like director after it finally gets approved, how was it like, like, ha- like having like, kind of like give room for a team to kind of add their own like creative input sometimes. Cause you know, you've done all the character designs, you've done all the stuff, you've completed all the stuff. But when it came down to it, chances are that wasn't gonna be the exact final product. And you had to get ideas from someone else. Like, you know, you wrote the whole script, like, uh, like word for word, you said, you know, like true director writes their own script, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. But when it came down to it, were there times where you had to kind of like sacrifice or spare some of those ideas in order to give room for a mutually creative thinking environment when you're making your films? Absolutely. I mean, Cam, <laughs> I'm so used to talking to you that this is weird that we're in the, in the Q&A and this is happening. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you guys my experience. So in school, I basically did all my stuff. I graduated from school. I got paid to do all my stuff. When I got laid off and I had to work on other people's things, that was a huge eye opener. Mm. to How important being a, a part of the team was. And that's when I really, really, really valued like, oh, this is what it's gonna be like if I ever get the shot to do my own stuff again for me to direct someone else. So I started studying directors and I started studying anybody above me, how they would treat me, how they would, who would get the best work out of me. And it was always when people would enable me and trust me, right? 
Because if I'm forced to do something, I will give you exactly what you want, but I'm not giving you a freaking cent more. <laughs> but if you give me freedom and you encourage me, guess what? I'm going to give you even more than you asked for. And I'm going to get emotionally invested in what you're in what you want. And then I'm with you. And then it's ride or die. Like mm -hmm. we are in this together. Mm -hmm. And that was early on in my career. I figured it out. And I figured out directors who knew that. And I figured out directors who didn't know that. And then I saw that obviously all artists are different. Some artists do thrive on the, on the, you know, berating world, but most artists don't. Most artists really do their best when they're encouraged and they're trusted. So that's something that in school, you know, animation is a team sport. So learning that skill is very important. Learning to work well with others is very important. No one, and I mean this, no one is good at everything. Mm. Impossible, impossible. Just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're good at everything. So that's something to, to take under consideration. Story to me is very difficult. And story is the one thing where you never get lucky. Because you can get lucky in design and when the first try, something beautiful happens. And I don't think you can get lucky in animation and accidentally animation uh, <laughs> good happens. But man, story, if anything, the, the natural state of story is crappy. So you're always starting in a bad place and you're working the whole time to make it good. Whereas with animation, I feel like you're starting at zero and you're giving it life and you could be giving it bad life, but you're at least you're starting on zero. It's not like someone broke your hands and they're like, all right, now start animating. Cause that's what story feels like. Yeah. Every story has been told. Every story has been, you know, done to death. How are you going to make something different, but familiar? Oh, that to me, that's what's super, super hard about story. But yeah, trusting, is, is very important. And then as a director, you're only as good as your collaborations and you're only as good as your team and you're only as good as those who are willing to trust you if you trust them. And it's all trust. It really is all trust. And guess mm -hmm. what? If things go well, you're gonna wanna work with them again. If things don't go well and other directors ask you, what do you think about blah, blah? They're like, yeah, nope. And that goes, oh, they're like waves. But no man or woman is an island. So you got to be really, really, really smart about these things, Cam. And you got to be really good about going, I'm really good at this, but I could be better at everything. All right, we got a question from Bayardo. Yes, go ahead. Funny because I left my my first name because my I go by my middle name Josh, but I'm like Jorge is here. I might as well go by Bayardo today. Um, <laughs> Why, not? Why not? This is the day to do it. Um, so first off, I want to say uh, my family we love Book of Life. We watch it every year for Day of the Dead, uh -huh. and I think you connected to my mother most when we first saw it in theaters. And Mumford and Stun started playing in mariachi form. She loves them. So I think that's the moment she loves the film. I can't wait to tell her when she gets off work tonight. I'm like, guess who's at uh, our school today? The director from Book of Life. She's going to love it. I think one of my, my questions, the biggest question I have is, I'm a screenwriter uh, who is very passionate about animation. I almost went into animation, but a part of me was like, oh, I don't know if I have the skill for that level. Let's start with, let's just go to story. And I always want, I've always wanted to write for and have shows that are animated, but I'm not an animation student. Do you have any advice for people who are going, want to go into this animated field that don't have, um, you know, school experience with animation, but want to, you know, go into it through the writing process? Absolutely. Uh, I will say half of showrunners in animation are writers. So going in from the writing angle is very, 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 uh, not only normal, but I would say it's getting bigger and bigger. And then in feature animation, it's happening too. Mm -hmm. uh, Jen Lee, who co-directed Frozen 1 and Frozen 2, who now runs uh, Disney feature animation, is a writer, came from the writing side. Uh, a lot of the Pixar co-directors are writers. Sony's doing the same thing. You know, writers are becoming the co-directors of animated features. So I think you're in a really good path. Uh, there's never more writing in animation uh, need. So the, the 
you know, writers who love the medium are, are really, really, really integral. I really believe, and this is why I encourage anybody who wants to be a director to write is the big decisions honestly are happening in the script. And so if you're not involved in that, it's almost impossible to steer the ship in a different direction because that's what everybody signs off on. That's what the budgets are based on, especially in CG. Uh, so in the 2D world, you could in boards come up with a whole new sequence and CG, they go, hold on, we budgeted it for this set, we budgeted it for these characters. You can change the lines, you can change how you design these things a little bit, but all those decisions happen in script. So it's a, it's a very, very, very uh, fundamental, important thing. It works for live action, it works for animation. Yes, we will embellish. Yes, we will come up with a bazillion gags, but the era of we'll figure it out in boards is very expensive, right? That's why the, there's $200 million movies. Uh, and a lot of times those movies, you go, that's $200 million, where'd that go? Well, that's because people had to sit for a year waiting for story to be figured out. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I really encourage you to apply to all the writing programs, all the, the you know, the fellowships. There's a really good one at Nickelodeon. Uh, Netflix, I believe, has one. And you basically go in there, you submit your sample scripts, uh, the type of shows you want to work on or the type of movies you want to work on, and you, you sort of go through it just like you would if you were an artist. But uh, jobs for, for animation writers, it's very competitive, just like anything else. Yeah. Uh, but there's a ton. There is a ton of work out there. So good, good for you. Thank you. Good on. You, you picked well. See, there you go. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's keep this going. This is great. Uh, Fiona, you got a question for Jorge. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first, thanks for coming. It's great to hear your wisdom and your experience. Um, my first exposure to your work was actually El Tigre. Aww. I watched that religiously. <laughs> um, and something that is really interesting to me about your work is just how many ideas and so, like different stories you've created over the years. And my question is related to being, you know, precious about those ideas and stories. Like, when is it helpful to be precious about an idea and like, you know, hold it really closely? And when is it not helpful? Fiona, you're going to hate this answer, but it's a really good <laughs> question. But you have to be precious about all of it. And, you know, when people say you got to kill your babies and see people go, no, no, don't use the, you know, those phrasing. No, use it because that's how much it hurts. Mm -hmm. But you have to love these things because if you don't love them, people can tell. And if you don't love them, the people who fund these things and the people you pitch to, the producers, they go, hmm, they're, they don't believe in it. Why should we believe in it? Mm -hmm. So you have to be precious. And when they kill them or they change them, you have to mourn them and then you gotta move on and you gotta make more. And it's a horrible, horrible part of what we do, but that's, that's part of the process. Uh, you know, Guillermo del Toro always says, you have to have the heart of a poet, but the endurance of a boxer. Because if you don't have the heart of a poet and you're just there to fight, nothing will happen. And if you're just a poet, and to, you don't learn how to box, they're gonna kill you. So you gotta have both. You gotta have both. For me, one of the things that got thrown at me early on in my career was, you're just a one trick pony. And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, you just do Mexican stuff. So instead of going, I'll show you and I'll do all these other Mexican things, I took that and I'm like, all right. Again, the analogy of the restaurants, I'm a Mexican restaurant and I'm gonna cook so many amazing different dishes from Mexico that you have no idea. And so that's what I did, right? To me, it was all my favorite creators create multiple things. All my favorite creators are willing, in my opinion, to take chances and fail, because that's a big one, as long as you as long as you're okay failing, you're going to be good because you're going to learn. Because if you're not okay with failing, that means you're never going to try. And if you never try, you never learn. So failure, remember, 
the staircase of success, every step is failure. I like failure like I like ice cream. I'll, I'll eat it up. There's always room for failure. Bring it on. Sonia, you're up. Okay, cool. Well, thanks, Jorge, for sharing your story and your amazing journey with us. Um, and my question is actually based on uh, some of the painting work that you've done. Because a couple years back, I came across uh, kind of like an anthology book that had some of the work that you've done. And I was just curious to know, um, within your painting and also with creating these new uh, series, which artists do you find yourself being inspired by today? Like in addition to the ones who inspired you from before? So, Sonia, think, awesome <laughs> question. So I love painting, right? I, I, I painted when, ever since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of what we do in animation, it's super expensive and it requires a lot of people and it requires a lot of approvals for things to move forward. Whereas with painting, I don't have to ask anybody for anything and I just get to do it and I get to decide when it's done or not done. So I literally do, I paint because it allows me to finish things. That's another awful thing about what we do that no one can be, no one can finish a film in a day, but you can finish a painting in a day. So that sense of completion, it, painting does for me. Uh, what also painting has done for me is, it honestly has allowed me to say a bunch of crazy things that I'm not allowed to say in animation. I get to say them in paintings. So it allows me to speak with a different voice. Uh, the, I've, I've, you know, I dipped my toe in the art world. It's, it's just as shady as the film world in a whole different way. So it feels yeah. familiar and rewarding in a total way. Uh, and then the, uh, you know, the thing with, with, with painting too, uh, was it's allowed me to try a lot of things that eventually end up in my paintings, in, in, my, in my animation work. And then the two painters I adore, and I will admit one of them is a horrible human being, are uh, Basquiat and Picasso. Those two wow. are my, my heroes. Uh, when you look at their body of work, you know, Basquiat did uh, over 1,500 paintings before he died at 27. Picasso did like 18,000 paintings before he died. And my favorite Picasso stuff is the later years uh, when, he, when he basically stopped worrying and he was free, right? I always say he saw death, mm -hmm. he saw death coming and he let go. And he just was just painting straight out of the heart and, and painting crazy stuff. So I really admired their body of work and I really admired the, the experimentation I found I find both of them hilarious. I think their paintings are really funny. I think they're cartoonists at heart uh, and, and super personal and super graphic and weird. And I love that about painting because I don't think I will ever be allowed to do that in animation to just try crazy stuff and try different ideas. So painting has been an outlet for me in that stuff. Uh, but I have to admit it kind of happened by accident. Uh, someone with a gallery saw Book of Life in a plane and landed and said, hey, I saw your movie. I think you're a painter. You want to have a show? <laughs> and, uh, and I had painter a mural uh, in Dallas uh, that I think, Tony, you might've gone to, but basically I painted a mural outside of a, a, at a biker bar. Because everybody oh, I, would- I, I remember driving by that with you. Yeah. We were in the car together and you're like, oh, I did that. And I'm like, what? what? You, you made that building? What did you do? Oh. Well, <laughs> He's there, like, there no, I painted that. It was like a community thing and there was a biker bar and all the bikers would pee on this wall. Uh, so it was a contest to paint murals. And I said, oh, I want the, the pee wall. Give me the worst wall in Dallas and I'll paint something and I will shame those bikers uh, to not peeing on the wall. So I, you know, nice. it was this crazy painting and sure enough, uh, the bikers never peed again and because they would have models and, and commercial shoots happen there on the wall. <laughs> so the bikers <laughs> were very happy, by the way. So it was a win-win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I had a ton of leftover paint from the mural. So when this guy said, I'll give you an art show, I said, well, I have seven paint cans, so I'll use them up. So I went to Michael's and I bought all these, uh, you know, $10 canvases. And he asked me for nine paintings and I showed up with 57. Uh, yeah. And, you know, don't tell anybody, but 
uh, they sold they sold a ton, a ton of, and I became a painter. So all because of bikers not being able to uh, pee in the bathroom. Uh, so I have those those livers to think. Yes, <laughs> those biker livers. All right, Mateo. Um, we might only have time for one more. Let's see, Mateo. All right, this is my time to shine. <laughs> Well, Don't get cocky now, Mateo. Just ask the question. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, first off, man, thank you for coming to our, our, our class and for uh, answering all of our questions here. It's a real honor to um, be here with you. Um, I guess I, my question isn't too related to animation, but it is there. Um, in, a, in, a, in a video that you had with, uh, with, with Bobby Chu, um, you guys were talking about... Um, how working with you, how working with your wife has been like a really great like partnership. You guys have like this really cool system and all that stuff. I just wanted to know like if uh, um, if your opinion on like working with like your significant other has like changed in any way, or uh, or like how it's like gotten even better when working on my end of three, um, if she's a part of that or not or something like that. Because I don't, know, I was listening to that and I thought it was like really cool. That, that you had said something like that, that it was like that working with your wife was great. So I don't know, just wanted to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So my wife and I uh, met in high school at a punk rock concert and we've been together ever since. So how that's affected my work is I've never had my heart broken, <laughs> right? I basically married the, the, my first love. And so I will be eternally a romantic because uh, I've never felt that pain in my life. And you can see it in my work. It's everything. It's all, they're all love stories, really. Yeah, it's always very optimistic, too, right? Yeah, I'm very optimistic. And my wife is a badass. For anybody who's ever met her, uh, she suffers from no fools. She's from Tijuana. Uh, so she's super tough. Uh, she punched me in the face. Uh, what was it? A week, a week after we met, I dared her. I said, I bet you'd never punch me in the... And before I could finish foot. Her, her like literally like whoosh. and like as the blood came down and I tasted my own blood I was like I'm gonna marry this girl uh, <laughs> <she's wild. laughs> so, uh, yeah so at, at, and at that point she she was an artist too and I'm you know obviously I'm an artist uh, and I and for all any of you who know our art history there's a very famous couple in in Mexican uh, history Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera Oh, yeah. And so my pitch to Sandra was, we could be the, the Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo cartoons. <laughs> and she, uh, she thought that was the most ridiculous thing in the world. Uh, but what that did was early on, we were forming ourselves and we were becoming artists because that's what happens in school together. So we grew together and we evolved together. And as, as, and as artists, I gravitated towards certain things and she gravitated towards certain things. And early on, we went, you know what? Why don't you do this and I'll do this? Because the worst thing you can do is when you both do the same thing. And so we kind of split. And it was, you love doing cute things and you love drawing women. I love drawing dudes and monsters and, and, and weird things. That's our relationship. You want to put something beautiful, but something really ugly next to it. You want to make something look really masculine, put something really feminine next to it. So that contrast became our advantage. So we've always worked together. We've never not worked together. Everybody warned us, you can't work with your wife, you can't work with your husband, that you know, what, what? it worked for us. We've never not done it. And some people are like, well, how do you go home and not talk about it? We don't, this is our life. We talk about it all the time. And we talk about designs and she's brutal with me. And I like it, like that's, that's our relationship. Um, as time went by, El Tigre happened and we co-created El Tigre, but when El Tigre got canceled, I let go, right? I was super thankful. I was like, thank you for spending $20 million on our idea. We'll take our five Emmys and go home. Thank you. <laughs> Sandra was like, F you guys, <laughs> I'll cut you. <laughs> <laughs> So she she was very upset and she did not uh, she did not want to be hurt again. So after that, uh, we had a kid, and she now works part time to help me uh, with designs and she reads stories and she 
basically helps me with all these things, but she's now focusing half, half her time on our son, half her time on animation. Uh, for Maya and the three, she designed Maya, she designed all the females. So we have, that hasn't changed. Uh, it's just her involvement full time is different. Yeah. Uh, but I could never make anything without her. Maya is, for when you guys see it, is my love letter to her. It's really her story. Uh, mm. And she gets pissed when I talk about that stuff, but she's my hero. So of course I'm gonna make a thing about her. Uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been having, working with the love of your life, working with someone you, you admire and someone you love and someone who hurts you and makes you laugh, like all those things, it's incredible. So when people say, don't work with other, don't, you know, don't marry another artist. I always say, no, being with someone like you is, is going to be amazing because they'll get you and you'll get them in ways. You know, I always talk about civilians and artists and <laughs> civilians and artists relationships work really well. And artists, artist relationships, a lot of times don't work, but when they do work, it's incredible. Yeah. So risk, bet on yourself. Ah, there you go. Well, it certainly has worked for you guys. I love hearing stories about how you talk about uh, Sandra and <clears throat> your deep and abiding love for her and how you constantly call her the muse because she is an inspiration to you. And uh, uh, we're going to have to call this to an end because, yes, we are. You got a heart out and you've been so generous with your time. Everybody, let's hear it for Jorge Gutierrez in the house with APU today. Thank you for all the students that joined, but also for all the guests that uh, joined too. And if you're interested in APU at all, yeah, check us out online at apu.edu. And uh, there's a cinematic arts program. And then of course, animation is growing and thriving here. And uh, yes, uh, Jorge, thank you again. And um, I just hope uh, the best for you with, with Maya and the Three and with all your stuff that you're doing at Netflix. You're, you're living the dream, buddy. Uh, I hope you know uh, it's such a oh. blessing to see. It's such, it's such, it's so inspiring. It's just so wonderful, man. I'm really proud of you, and I'm really happy for you. Tony, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And again, we're the golden era of animation. Take advantage of it. We are. I tell them all the time. Good. Yeah.